chapter 13 of Environmental Science 1401, which includes chapter 17 and 18 of your book. And we're gonna look a little at environmental health and justice and how we make decisions about the environment um, based on our basic principles and how we feel we should treat the environment. So in this lecture, we're going to look at some of the principles of environmental health and a little on specifics that make us ill, like microorganisms and toxics and exposure, and then how do we manage risks with toxins. And then we're going to look at, uh, once we look at all the environmental risks, we're going to look at how do these risks affect the community and how are these risks disproportionate for the, particularly the people that don't benefit as much from um, the environmental resources. So the lesson we're going to basically get out of this lecture is that, guys, any time we use resources or we try to build a society based on, you know, human-based or anthropogenic principles and needs, we're going to have some benefits and we're going to have some risks and harm associated with those benefits. The problem we see in the world is that some people benefit disproportionately to resources and others are harmed disproportionately to resources. And unfortunately, we see that most of this harm and the least of the benefits go to uh, lower income people, many inner city people, and also people in developing nations. And it even includes the risks of natural hazards. We do see disproportionate harm caused by people. And then during recovery, we don't see the full benefits of recovery in people that are in high risk situations or in poverty also. So what's this whole idea of environmental health? And environmental health basically is just um, how is our personal health and community health affected by the environment? And that could be the natural environment. That means like on a day when trees are producing pollen, you know, who gets sick and how much and what are the consequences of that and what do we do about it? And also the anthropogenic factors, that means our industry producing pollution and how we basically plan cities where people live in sometimes uh, polluted income areas. So when we look at environmental health, um, there's various ways that the environment can harm us. And the most common way is through pollution, through the introduction of toxins. And these could be natural toxins or um, human-made toxins, which we sometimes call anthropogenic toxin. So um, the World Health Organization does have its own definitions of harm, and there are various ways, again, that we can be harmed through chemical exposure, through exposure to loud sounds, through basically sometimes too much urban lighting, and to natural and susceptibility to natural disasters. And we see that environmental health is studied in various ways through epidemiology, which means who, what's the distribution of harm that people uh, encounter and who's being harmed in a particular way. And that takes into account um, gender, age, and ethnicity, and genetics in general. We can look at toxicology, which means what's the impact of certain hazards on the body, particularly things we call toxins and toxicants. And um, the whole idea of environmental justice that the that um, harm tends to be uh, di um, distributed unequally in people and in populations. So when we look at the concept of epidemiology, believe it or not, it, it does have a legal definition according to a government agency called the Centers for Disease Control. And, and um, the principles, you know, it's a field of science, the principles of epidemiology go back a long time and both, mostly it's a way of tracking disease. And we do have uh, historical perspectives of this is um, in, in when you start looking at the middle 1800s is our own technology and the way we treated our human waste were killing us. I mean, literally people were dying on the streets from air pollution and from sewage. And this was um, becoming much more prevalent in the crowded cities of Europe and in cities that we colonized, particularly the United States. And um, various researchers investigated you know, correlations between, let's say, um, where people get their water or where people live and the air pollution or sewage treatment. So these principles got established over a long period of time. We also see that through 
with food production through the um, Food and Drug Administration, where we were looking at food poisoning and how does processing and regulations affect this. So when we look at epidemiology, it's a way of looking at how people become harmed and in what environment and what sections of the population are undergoing harm due to something that we uh, measure that can create harm. I think of epidemiology more as being a mathematics and statistics. When we look at the whole idea of toxicology, this is looking at the actual principle of how does something harm us and how do you measure harm? And again, these principles go back to the 1800s, particularly when we look at uh, occupational hazards, uh, including, you know, not just at work in, an, in a company or a factory, but also work at home. You know, so we've learned over time that certain segments of the population became sick from materials or environments they were working in. And toxicology, again, is more or less looking at the cause and effect of harm and how much exposure to a particular thing, like a toxin, which is a natural poison, or a toxicant, which is um, an artificial poison, or to some type of um, physical feature of the uh, uh, of the environment that can create harm, like sound that you work that you run into in the military and in industry and in uh, the airline industry. So toxicology is more of a science of are we really being harmed? What type of harm? Uh, what is the level of harm uh, that is acceptable in the body? And also, what are the chemistry or physics of the harm? So, guys, there are, there are very, very classic cases I'd like you to read about in your book, you know, about toxicology and how epidemiologists discovered the causes of certain exposures, like an area called the uh, Love Canal in Niagara Falls had the pleasure of driving uh, by there a couple of times uh, a couple of years ago in uh, upstate New York. And uh, this was a whole neighborhood that literally became polluted due to um, inscrupulous building practices, where we built a whole community over 200,000 tons. Think about it, a ton is 2,000 pounds of hazardous materials that eventually got into the soil, into, and that meant getting into foods and getting into the water supply. And, and, these, and we had to as a government, we had to prove, you know, in order to sue the housing development that did this, that these chemicals that were released were actually causing harm. And this is probably the biggest problem when we look at harm, because we got to prove that if there's a bunch of sick children out there, that those children's illnesses were directly related to the chemicals that we believe were causing the harm. And this was a big problem even with Flint, Michigan, because I had the pleasure of working with the Flint, Michigan people. And the problem I did have with them is many of the illnesses they were talking about were not due to what was found in the water. And in some cases, just the levels of contaminants in the water could not explain the amount of illnesses that we saw. So we had to look at other factors like stress or just illness in general that was not related to the water and due to other factors that we had to find out to again see, well, what was that due to? How could we stop that? Because there are many things in our environment that can cause harm. And what toxicology tries to do is turn a correlation of, two, of, a, of a toxin being present with illness into a cause and effect, meaning we have evidence that the toxin is doing that. And I run into this over and over again with environmental groups and people that call me for consultation and advice. And I always hate telling them that we have to see experimental methods in order to resolve this issue of is a toxin or something really causing the harm that we think it is or that we suspect it is. So there are many things that can cause harm. And we are really now running into a society where microorganisms are having a bigger and bigger impact on environmental health. And COVID's a great example. How we live amongst agricultural animals and how we infringe on where wildlife is, is exposing us to the diseases of domesticated and wild creatures more and more. And uh, that even includes people that hunt, expose themselves to the disease of deer and other game that could be transmitted to humans. How we live in urban areas accelerates the, the passage of disease and puts us in contact with roaches and rats that can spread again, novel types of diseases. And we've learned through urbanization that the number of diseases spreads rapidly, including the development of agriculture introduces to many disease. So organisms that cause disease are usually fit into a 
category called pathogens. Now, if there's some creatures that live in us that don't cause harm, but in a way they could, they're called opportunistic, and there are other creatures that live as parasites, which means they don't always cause harms, but they do benefit from our bodies at some slight risk of having them living in us. For example, the, uh, like mosquitoes or like certain worm diseases. And we refer to pathogens sometimes as biological hazards. That means some type of contagion that can spread through us through what we call biological means. That means exposure to them directly or to other people that have that pathogen. Guys, please read in your book about the major types of biological hazards that we uh, run into. And we can classify biological hazards based on a type of organism or on the type of disease that those organisms cause. So we can look at respiratory infections as a way of looking at environmental health. And there are people that that's all they study. So we can see that respiratory infections can be due to chemical exposures like toxins or toxicants. It could be due to um, infectious creatures like viruses, which cause uh, cold and flu, and of course, uh, COVID. Um, it can uh, be due to bacterial infections that can cause pneumonia uh, or tuberculosis and other types of diseases. And we're seeing that there's a direct uh, correlation between poverty and an increase in these diseases and also crowded living condition and access to medicine uh, also promotes these diseases if we don't have adequate access to good medicine. And children in particular uh, tend to be susceptible to these type of diseases as well as the elderly and those that also live under stress or immune compromise. And when we start looking at these categories of diseases like respiratory in particular, many things can cause these and we have to be able to isolate that and test it and look at ways to remediate it. It could also pass along and, and develop digestive system disorders, that means of the intestines and the stomach. And usually these show up as uh, a lot of times diarrheal diseases or diseases that cause openings or bleeding in the digestive system. Um, and, and many of these, again, are very common uh, due to, this could be due to transmission of food through contaminated water, sometimes through direct contact. And a lot of times, again, we see these very early in history with um, the way we prepare food and also with the way we dispose of our water or obtain our water. And this is even also true with the way we treat our pets, like dog feces and cat feces are major contaminants in which those feces should not be present in the soil. I mean, they should literally, dog and cat feces should be bagged and sealed and put into um, a, um, a disposal site or should be somehow composted by people that know how to treat it and turn it into a safe fertilizer. Cat feces should not end on the toilet, and that's probably true for dog feces too, because sewage treatment plants can't handle the types of parasites that can sometimes spread through cats and dogs. For example, worms and, and a protist called toxoplas toxoplasma. So these diseases can be fatal and particularly true in young children and people that are malnourished and people that live in poverty. And this is probably one of the biggest killers, diarrheal diseases, of children globally. When we think about these are the most treatable diseases because it just basically involves sanitary uh, handling of food and also the sanitary treatment of water. That means both drinking water and sewage water. Blood-borne pathogens that either comes from direct contact with animal blood or human blood or contact with vectors like mosquitoes and flies that drink blood and then go from host to host, spreading the blood from person to person. Um, these diseases, again, are most prevalent in poor environments where insect control is minimum, in developing countries where we find that, uh, again, mos uh, mosquito and fly control is minimum, and plus particularly in rainy and warm areas where these insects thrive. Um, it is, um, th there are many factors that cause this, and many of diseases go back a long way in human history, and, and we still haven't resolved them. Some of the biggest killers in the world are malaria and sleeping sickness, and these are ancient diseases that still cannot be treated due to basically the prevalence and also the cost of treating them. And the thing about treating them too, guys, is there's environmental harm that comes with eradicating particularly blood-borne diseases.
So this is always going to be a big issue. And particularly these diseases are very susceptible to climate change. We're seeing as climate change occurs, the places where these mosquitoes and flies live and also other types of creatures that spread the diseases um, where they live. And these diseases are being seen in areas that have never seen them before. As I mentioned earlier, um, where do we find a lot of pathogens, particularly what we call pathogenesis in societies? Look at your book and pay attention to this chart, because this is a very important chart because it shows that Africa basically and, and, part, and South Asia lead the world on where these diseases occur. And these are countries that don't have a lot of money to put into this or have incredibly large populations that is just too expensive to do. When we look at um, United States, Europe, and uh, basically Canada, we're pretty safe. And what's sad is that when we look at how we run pharmaceutical companies and how we research disease, most of these rich countries here only research diseases that help the people here and not the people here. Because this is where the income comes from down here when, we're, when you're looking at pharmaceutical countries making money. So a lot of the, you know, so there's a lot of factors that determine where these pathogens strike. And there's also a lot of economic factors that say why these are still prevalent problems, but mostly in developing nations or low income nations and even in low income areas in developed countries. God, guys, one thing that's very, very important to keep in mind now when we start looking at a growing population, because under, remember, our human population is growing exponentially, and particularly in countries and areas that are already crowded. And as we look towards the future, you've learned in this class that we're becoming more and more urbanized, which means people will be more crowded together. So we're going to start seeing an incredible increase of toxin-related diseases, toxicant-related diseases. Um, diseases associated with living in crowded areas and also with infectious agents, even those that are transmitted by vectors like mosquitoes, flies, and, and rats, and even uh, pets and wildlife. So, um, and, and we're seeing it, we've seen this with uh, the COVID-19, we've seen this with Zika and other types of diseases that are spreading like wildfire and at rates and amounts that we've never seen before in history. So, um, when we you know start looking at future risks, um, we we're trying to find strategies to deal with this because sometimes medicine like vaccines and and other types of treatment can't keep up, and they can't be used in a lot of developing countries where we see higher incidences of these diseases, and a lot of that's just due to the cost or the feasibility of distributing medicines. So why can't we just let our immune system? deal with the issues of disease and in the old days that's what we did i mean i got a lot of the diseases that you guys are vaccinated for and i had family members that died from disease infectious diseases that are now treatable and looked at and dealt with family members that had polio and smallpox which is supposedly eradicated and he and i knew kids that literally died from measles so we get this idea of what's called herd immunity that means with all diseases eventually enough people become infected and ill that um, it immunizes or, or eventually protects the whole population because one thing once you get an illness if it doesn't kill you you are you are now able to be immune from that disease or resistant for the disease for a period of time now the problem is that can wear off in five to ten years and this and herd immunity requires a constant low exposure but when you look at a situation like covid where that disease just exploded it really caught us off guard and diseases can do that if there's no medicine to treat it and if people are densely populated and traveling around remember in the old days too people didn't travel that much now we are and we're more likely to spread disease so this whole idea of herd immunity you hear on the news, yes, it works, but do we want to look at the human risk? And herd immunity also takes into account the uh, other creatures that can spread this disease, what we call zoonotic diseases. So keep in mind that these problems will get worse until our population basically curbs itself or reaches carrying capacity, or unless we don't undergo a lot of 
massive urbanization or migration of populations into urban areas. So to get back to toxins and pollutants and things like that. So what does it mean when something is a toxin or is toxic? And again, we have these terms toxins, which are naturally occurring compounds and things called toxicants, which are human made compounds or sometimes exotic compounds. And the problem is everything could be toxic. Anything can cause harm. So the toxin is that anything can cause harm or injury to a person. And these toxins are usually of some type of chemical nature. So the toxin effects is dependent on the person. A lot of it on the uniqueness of the individual, also on the amount of toxin, how often you're exposed to it, at what levels, okay? The uniqueness of the toxin itself, its chemical makeup, how it enters the body has a big factor, like does it enter through the nose or through the skin? And, and, and what else is there in the environment that could cause what's called synergism? That means make the toxin have a bigger impact or sometimes even suppress the toxin in some cases. So this is a very detailed science that looks at and has to study us medically in order to see what that compound does in the body and who it affects and when and how. Now for toxins and toxicants to be harmful, the thing is, is they have to get into the body in order to do it, or you have to be exposed. And this takes into account things, uh, factors called risk factors. That means what is my risk of being exposed or what is my risk of having this compound enter my body to cause harm? And then what about my body determines the level of harm? So when we look at risk factors, for example, with air pollution, one risk factor for the harm from air pollution is stress. One is being a young child. Another is if you're a smoker. Another, if you are subject, sub, uh, sensitive to developing respiratory diseases in general, like you have pneumonias or you have lung damage from another issue. Um, so, these, so when we look at risk factors, this involves now epidemiology measuring the mortality, that means the death rate, or the morbidity, that means the disease rate of certain groups of people. And these studies can sometimes take into account 20,000 to 100,000 people that we have to study of different, uh, you know, gender, different age groups, different ethnicities, and even living in different areas like suburbs versus, you know, rich parts of the city versus poor inner city areas. So guys, toxins were known through a long history. I mean, we've known about hazardous substances for a long time, and people became aware of them. And sometimes they didn't become aware until they started using something a lot and found out, man, this is killing us or harming us. But the actual, you know, measures of toxicology go back to around, you know, the, the 1500s when the term was coined. And we, this was associated with, you know, different types of metals we used and different types of poisons in general that were not thought to be very harmful and then thought, you know, we discovered they cause a lot of harm. So the main thing when we look at, uh, what makes a poison? It's basically exposure and what we call dose. And, and we come upon these, when we look at dose, we look at dose as the amount of chemical, sometimes the exposure rate, or you know, over a period of time in relationship to your body, gender, size, and ethnicity. That means it's body chemistry. We look at a chemistry sometimes called a cytochrome P450 system. We can look at your liver's ability to deal with the toxin or the stomach's ability or your lungs ability to deal with the toxin. And, but we mostly look at body weight because that's a major factor too. So we have to pay attention to a level, a certain level of poison and a certain of exposure will harm people just proportionally based on body weight or body mass composition sometimes. But also of course, other things are risk factors too. But dose is important, but it's not absolute. The dose of a toxin that can harm a child is much less than the amount that it would take to harm a human, an adult. So what are some ways that your body is exposed to harm? And the, probably the fastest way to substance absorbed in the body is um, through your lungs, 
and this is a very big problem probably next is your digestive system and then the skin but also your eye surfaces and other parts of the body uh, can be sources of what we call exposure uh, or contact um, many compounds are what we call volatile and this is particularly true for stuff that enters the respiratory system we have an air pollutant that you know is called volatile organic compounds and these are not just present from car exhaust and industrial exhaust but also believe it or not naturally from vegetation okay uh, sometimes your eyes get sensitive to these things or you can develop allergies to these things um, volatiles could come from cockroaches believe it or not uh, but and, and particularly your house is loaded with volatile organic compounds that could enter the respiratory system and that includes chemicals present in paint and carpeting your appliances are given off compounds anything electrical chemical agents around the house and even toilet odors so um so look at this in your book and read about this whole idea of how constantly we're being barraged and this is why when we look at urban areas and particularly in households with lots of resources you are really exposing yourself to an incredible amount of compounds that we have never seen the likes in, in various generations now besides being transported through air um, uh, compounds toxic compounds can be transmitted through water in the form of what we call water soluble compounds and they transport easily through the body and luckily are most of them released from the body pretty much they're what are called fat soluble substances that means they don't dissolve in water but they can travel in soil on dust in the atmosphere they could also um, um, travel within the bodies of organisms and enter our way through the food chain um, they could also stick to piping and other thing and, persist, and, they, and exist in the environment for many years where they're absorbed in soil um, many compounds particularly the compounds we're concerned about a lot according to the environmental protection agency are what are called persistent compounds that means that these last in the environment for sometimes dozens or hundreds of years and they can travel throughout the food chain and through the biogeochemical cycling so we spend a lot of time as a society as a global society I'm looking at these persistent compounds because these are compounds that once you produce them they can have incredibly long term effects from generation to generation and also exist in the environment for a multitude of years and many of these compounds unfortunately are the results of plastics and many types of um, uh, petrol oil based compounds that we use many compounds you know unfortunately come from our drinking water and a lot of compounds we see um, come I mentioned earlier from paints that tend to volatile volatilize or you know just contact with the paint can cause poisoning so we have many incidents of how sometimes we have what's called hidden or unexpected exposure to many materials and please read about this again because we find this particularly true in older areas and areas that are impoverished that don't have the proper uh, means of reducing exposure to these compounds or have historical exposure that nothing has been done about Again, environmental toxins can make their way through food consumption through contaminated water or contaminated soil or contaminated people um, workplace is a big source of exposure depending on where you work and just because you're not maybe in a manufacturing factory doesn't mean that you're not exposed to something and unfortunately we've learned that many people can bring these compounds home on their clothing or in their body and spread it to family agricultural workers in particular are exposed to many agricultural chemicals that are used on plants and livestock and they can make their way throughout the farmers bodies and the families of the farmers too and throughout the community so guys as a society we do have to accept a fair amount of risk to live with the wants and needs that we have and the greater your wants the more likely you're going to expose yourself to risks that are associated with those wants and a lot of our basic needs you know require risk to obtain those and to keep them at a, at a volume and at an input that you know is necessary for us to survive without too much stress so we have you know 
models called risk management models, which balance the whole idea of providing us with our wants and needs, but also looking at the environmental impacts of it, but not just the environmental impacts on us, but also wildlife and what we call ecosystem services. So there are many, many laws internationally that balance these risks. And, and sometimes societies take very high risks. That means that they accept a high degree of human illness and environmental illness for the sake of having those resources. Other countries are very strict that they want almost no ne or negligible human illness and we just have to pay the cost of it or not have access to those resources as much as we'd like. So there are major ways of looking at this as far as what is risk and what are the benefits that we want from those risks and what is the quality of life that we expect and also how much medical bills are we willing to pay to remediate any risks. So again, on this slide, um, there are classic examples of risks and benefits and BPA, what was called bisphenol A, which is a compound that was present in almost every type of plastic in a fair amount of lubricants. And this thing was just found all over the world. And then we found out it can cause endocrine diseases in animals. Uh, it could harm plants, but primarily humans. And it could affect how your body, you know, responds to gender development. So these chemicals were prevalent and, and we felt necessary. And we looked at ways of replacing them and some of the costs and benefits of that, but also what are the inconveniences of doing that and the expenses. So um, Europe treated this a little differently than the United States, and some countries are more strict about this than others. But this is a classic compound that I know I've been working with for many years on a, what were called endocrine disruptor uh, committee meetings and groups. And we have seen a great decline of this compound, but also it's very persistent. So sometimes hard to tell how our efforts to remove this compound are affecting the environment because there's still large enough levels out there. And we do have to find safe alternatives. That's the problem because this compound was also found in water pipes and in housing materials and everything around us. So there are classical case studies that go back a long way when we start looking at risk management and what are we willing to do to eliminate a risk that might not be seen in the, in the short term, but definitely has long term impacts. Because sometimes it's difficult to spend a lot of money on something that's not going to show up in 10 to 20 years or is only affecting a certain part of the population, which it's unfair to put a certain population at risk when the rest of us are getting the benefits that this population may not. And why should we put them at harm for something we're getting a benefit from but not being harmed? And this slide is just a reinforcement of what I've been saying all along, is the disproportionate impacts of risks versus the benefits that we get from being exposed to environmental harm. Because guys, everything we do is gonna cause environmental harm. But again, we can minimize that harm to the environment, to ourselves, and the thing is, we also have to be aware that we have to protect people that are more likely to be susceptible to that harm. And we've had presidents that have done work with that. We've had international conventions that met with that, particularly with mercury and with what are called uh, you know, with DDT. And of course, with uh, uh, biphenyls and those type of compound phthalates. So we do have a history of regulation, but we still see a lot of this disproportionate impacts occurring in any any type of environmental issue, not just toxins, but other things, environmental stress, noise pollution, you know, uh, uh, water pollution, exposure to microorganisms, you name it. We have disproportionate impacts. And COVID-19 pandemic has taught us that too, that healthcare is a major factor to determine disproportionate impacts of environmental harm on us. Guys, we have to understand waste disposal, which we've learned in this class, is also a major factor on the risk burden we put on people. And most waste sites are gonna be in areas where poor people live or you know, basically underserved communities and also in countries that 
tend to not have enough money for proper waste disposal. And guys, when we have waste dumping, that means when we have a waste that's very toxic in our country, we dump it elsewhere. And the United States has done that to Mexico for years along the Mexican border. We've also produced manufacturing in areas along the Mexican border in areas called the Macadars, where we were allowing those areas to be polluted for products that are benefiting our population and not the population of Mexicans. Now, yeah, we promised them jobs, but usually not high paying jobs, but, but they received the pollution burden. And we have a habit of doing dirty businesses, mining, recycling, and manufacturing in countries other than ours, where these people are being exposed to the harm and we're not. So guys, this is kind of a little sidetrack, but um, when we look at humans and how we use our forest resources, this has become a big issue now with some of the physical hazards, which is also a chemical, about the environment. So we are seeing an unprecedented increase in wildfires. That means fires that are not natural, they're, human, they're affected by human activities or created by humans. Uh, unintentionally and sometimes intentionally. So with the growth of agriculture, guys, we're finding people are burning down forests, everything from rainforests to prairies, in order to set up farmlands. That's the quickest way to clear land. We burn trash, okay? We have wildfires that are occurring due to global climate change, where areas are becoming more dry or less rain and they're becoming more subject to fire. Um, we're seeing damage, uh, due to hurricanes that produces a lot of dead trees that are also susceptible to fire. So these are other factors that we're running into now and having to deal with, not just in the United States, but globally. And we're starting to read more about these fires. And it's not that the news is bringing them out more often or being more aware of them. These are actually on the increase in various countries. So other physical hazards, we have geological hazards which usually, um, and so we start looking at things like landslides, earthquakes, these are all natural. Tsunamis, of course, these are giant waves created usually by plate tectonics. So these are natural things that humans have been dealing with for a long time. Some of these things though are becoming worse because we're building in areas and living in areas that are more susceptible to earthquakes and urban areas tend to be much more susceptible to tsunamis, earthquakes, and landslides. And also, as we build dense populations in these areas, we're seeing more deaths and destruction occurring as a result of this and more lives being displaced. And this is true globally. We tend to settle in areas that these natural disasters occur. So please read about them in your book and think about our own area. What affects us? We learned about energy and particularly nuclear energy in our areas and also how we get this urban sprawl and radiation hazard is tending to becoming a global issue too and a growing issue so particularly with the growth of nuclear energy we're seeing you know more and more transport of nuclear materials unfortunately we still have countries that practice nuclear weapons testing um and maybe our own country does that either with, probably not within the United States, but in other places that we designated for that testing. Um, we have radiation exposure in the food industry, not mostly to us, because guys, when food is irradiated, it doesn't affect you. But the people that work around it does. Guys being in front of screens produces radio uh, radiation, electromagnetic radiation can, can harm us. Um, so there's many, many, many hazards out there. Department of Energy did a wonderful study just on electrical circuitry, and it doesn't produce radioactivity, but it produces radiant energy that can be harmful to us, that can cause long-term damage. Uh, and power lines probably are not a big issue, unless you're literally hanging out for years, you know, within five feet of the power, high, you know, transmission lines, high power transmission lines. But particularly with radioactivity, we have something called radon gas, which is found naturally in soil. And it's not a big deal until you put buildings over the soil and a radon gas gets trapped in the building and concentrates. 
And as we start closing our buildings with air conditioning and heating units that don't recycle the outside air, radon can build up to levels that can um, harm us in the long term. So guys, this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. We're even living in areas that tend to have radioactive soils. And we use soils that sometimes have higher levels of radioaction as what we call backfill for building communities. So radiation is on the increase. And particularly, again, with just the way we use it for energy and the way that we settle in areas that tend to have high levels of radiation and the fact that we build buildings out of materials that may be radioactive in themselves. I mean, low enough levels not to kill you or make you sick outright, but in the long term, it could have an impact, particularly on children that are exposed for a lot of their lives. Radiation hazard could also come into play with sun exposure, with ultraviolet radiation. So we have a type of radiation we can measure based on UVA, UVB, or UVC. And this has to do with the intensity and the destructiveness of these compounds on the body. Some types of UV cause you to suntan if you tan. UVA and B could be destructive to the body, and it could be destructive to uh, plastics and other compounds too that we build and to, to materials in general. These can include, include uh, increase uh, skin cancer and increase decay of materials. This mixed with ozone can create a lot of problems. So ultraviolet radiation, guys, we could impact by ruining our ozone layer and reducing that. And also just sometimes our ex overexposure to sunlight through recreation is a big factor. So the importance of this course is for you to understand the harm that's created by our natural and human-made or anthropogenic environment. But also what's important is this whole idea of climate change. And guys, we are the creators of the climate change that we're seeing right now, the rapid climate change. But what caused it, how is unimportant compared to what are we gonna do about it and how are we gonna deal with it? And we are seeing unprecedented floods, unprecedented climate, you know, changes in humidity, changes in solar incidence, storm surges, and all sorts of things that can create harm. And the problem is with global climate change, guys, people are concentrated in areas that are most susceptible to the effects of climate change. That means hurricanes, floodings, uh, 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 um, tsunamis, all sorts of things. That means even agricultural areas where they're placed in susceptible areas to drought, because those are factors too, to too much heat, too much cold, prolonged snow, snow that becomes that comes too early or doesn't come at all are all factors. So we really got to think about our resiliency to climate change, because right now we're not doing much about it, but we have to work on sustainable methods and it's not impossible. We've learned with the COVID crisis that we could reduce climate change in a short period of time by not doing a lot of the things that contribute to it. But the thing is, is that if we bounce back to those levels of pollution, you know, creating the climate change factors, it's a loss. So we got to think about long-term ways of slowly reducing it to the point where we can maintain it and then reduce it in a way through generations that don't feel heavily impacted by these measures or not economically harmed by them. So again, what do we look forward to with global climate change? Extreme heat waves in some areas, not all areas, but some areas. We're going to see changes in precipitation, which can cause water droughts. And when you mix heat and drought together, which unfortunately some areas that are going to get excessive heat are also going to have drought. And this is occurring in agricultural areas which is going to kill us. And this could occur in densely populated areas, which could force people to leave. So these are, you know, some of the things we have to pay attention to. What are the impacts? And guys, extreme heat and long hot days can kill people. We know that from what's going on in Europe right now is people are dying from heat waves. And especially heat associated with drought can cause heat dehydration in a person 
besides heat-related illnesses in, in themselves. Guys, overall warming of the Earth will, and we know this already, will expand a range of particularly tropical creatures that tend to spread disease and also invasive creatures, because a lot of invasive creatures are kept out of various, so we can see an increase in diseases of our wildlife, diseases of our agricultural plants and livestock. Um, but the thing is, is that we can also see an increase in the longevity of these creatures in the area or their reproductive cycle. So as climate change occurs, some areas might actually lose their diseases and gain others. We can gain very deadly ones that we have never seen before, and this is already going on in the United States, where we're getting tropical diseases that are going up as far as Missouri and causing diseases we've never seen before and really have no good treatments and right now are not tooled up to deal with these. We don't have the proper vaccines. We don't have the proper medications. And we better start investing in this, not just to protect us, but the world overall. So just to repeat myself or reiterate the point, so when we look at global climate change, who's the most vulnerable? It's of course gonna be lower income areas, lower income countries, and areas where we can't put in the economic systems to be sustainable or to have resiliency to any type of global climate change related issues, particularly the anthropogenic ones. So we are seeing from analyses that started in 2015 that we're on a road to a very bad place as populations increase and resource use increases, then we got to do something about this. And again, a lot of the American population, European populations, Canadians, people that live in major cities and other countries that have a lot of wealth, they're not going to be affected by this as much. And we're going to have the resources to deal with a lot of it. But 90% of the earth is not going to. And these problems will become exacerbated as urban, urban areas grow and poverty tends to increase in those areas. So guys, please understand when we start looking at environmental decisions and again, wants and needs and what we're willing to accept as, in, as far as environmental risk goes, is that this is driven by the public, no matter where you are. And this is driven by the political systems that we set up and also by individual choices. So guys, how we shop, particularly in countries like ours, and really in any country, it determines what people are going to manufacture. And this is the whole model of supply and demand and, and, and also uh, places directing their resources to, for their maximum benefit as far as profit goes for companies. So, you know, we have various factors that determine our personal choice. And these personal choices could affect our driving, whether we do public transportation, whether we buy plastics, recycle, or do whatever. So these next few slides are going to be dealing with different types of attitudes, personal attitudes, that affect, you know, basically our exposure to risk. Now, probably the most basic thing has to do of how we make choices is based on a hierarchy of needs. And guys, and that means that some people, you know, live at these levels, but these are levels that exist in all of us. So we have what are called physiological needs. That means stuff that you need to make your body work, like food and water. And I hate to say, there's a place to poop safely and whatever. We have safety and security needs. That means you have to have live in an environment that's free from major stressors, from harm, either from people or from the environment. We have, most of us have a need for lung, love and belongingness. Okay, as we get away from what we call the basic needs, that means these are the ones that we fight for. These are the ones that we take risks for. Okay, these, I mean, are basic. Now, sometimes we have wants that also drive these, but those go beyond basic survival. And, and the wants are what we see a disproportionate distribution in. Now, we also have these self-esteem needs and also what's called self-actualization. And that just means once I stop worrying about the basic survival needs, either physical or mental, then we get into this whole idea of I'm not going to worry so much about 
resources as much as my entertainment and happiness. And that becomes a resource user in itself. Once we start thinking about reading books, going to movies and doing recreation, because recreation is not a basic need. Reading books is not a basic need unless you're using it to, make, to, to achieve basic needs. So this model looks at a baseline. And unfortunately, much of the world is willing to take a lot of risks to meet these three on the bottom. These are luxuries. That means we don't have to put a lot of risk and we can afford to charge a lot for these. These we can't afford to charge a lot because then societies and people get harmed. So this is one way we can look at how we use the environment based on basically what are we fulfilling as far as develop the level of our hierarchy of needs. We also have this principle called automatic thinking. And these are decisions that are what we call reflexive. That means it's usually learned. It's a gut feeling that you have. They could also be genetic. That means you taste something horrible. I mean, really, really horrible. Or there's a horrible odor that all of us would agree is horrible. So we have this concept called automatic thinking. And a lot of it is due to your upbringing. A lot of it is due to the interaction between your body and that thing you're meeting your need with. And these become a big problem because we see that when people have automatic thinking, they look at a way of responding and they don't think about any other options. Again, it's like what we call a reflex. And again, these are very difficult to combat. Uh, and one example is like we have a reflexive, uh, you know, act, uh, behavior of just throwing things in the garbage. And if you're in an area that doesn't recycle or group or the family doesn't recycle, it's very difficult for you to use recycling bins unless we make it easier and work it into the reflex. And some countries do that by not having trash cans at all. Everything goes into a, gar a, a recycle bin. But the problem is now you have to have the reflexive ability to be able to separate the stuff. And we're even moving towards single stream, which means you throw everything into the waste stream and then later on we separate it. That's a way of combating automatic thinking, but it's very difficult, inefficient, and effective to have to do things that way. We really have to train people young, early, and constantly to change the automatic thinking strategies. So think about in your own life, your own what we call status quo. That means your own way of doing things that we're used to and that we don't want to change those things because we tend to have this automatic thinking of loss averse. That means I don't want to get away from what I'm doing and I don't want to lose that, you know, way of life. So again, this is not something that's going to stop us from ever from being sustainable or from having resiliency, but it's something that we can teach ourselves and something, again, we can we can slowly work into society. And even our college has done this with our own energy efficiency programs and recycling programs and waste reduction programs. Guys, another thing that we have problems with too is humans and certain other org animals do this too. And I don't think plants do this, but they do have a, re a related thing to this called emotional defense mechanisms. That means we have this irrational side, this very subjective side that just thinks in a certain way that this is right or wrong. Not necessarily good or bad, but right and wrong. Sometimes we interpret that as absolute good, absolute bad, because sometimes your own emotions say that this is good for me, it must be good for everybody else. Or this is bad for me, it must be bad for everybody else. And this is a big problem. The emotional defense mechanisms and emotional thinkings tend to rule us. We see this with political campaigns, we see this with any type of social movement, is that people have strong emotions about things and they put up defenses that sometimes allow them to ignore reason and particularly ignore science, ignore evidence. And this sometimes becomes part of what we call social mechanisms. That means we, we, we build an emotional link between people or groups or thinkings that not only affects individuals, but affects a whole group. And this group now gets power where it can lobby or just be the in-group or become part of a political entity. 
that rules us. We see this all the time. And we even see this in advertising where these people do it, you must. And we develop this emotional connection to that. And then when we're not doing it, we get a defense mechanism that says, I can't not do that because I don't want to fit, you know, I don't want to be outside of that group think. So think about this with your own environmental attitudes. I've, I've heard people say that if we do alternatives, we're going to close down the petrol industry and put people out of work. And that's a defense mechanism, an emotional defense mechanism. That's not necessarily true. And it's not saying just because we have alternatives, it means we're going to shut down petrol. We still need petrol products for other purposes. And we're always going to have some need for chemical refineries for recycling, because the same chemical refineries that make stuff can be used for recycling materials. Some examples of how we can measure defense mechanisms, we can look at the, uh, the idea of denial. That means once something changes, let's say we set a new recycling law, and now you're forced to recycle, certain people just ignore, uh, deny it, and they go about doing their own thing, and sometimes even just dumping stuff and they emotionally distance themselves from that problem until eventually they have to resign themselves to it. That means they do it and somewhat reluctantly, or they can delegate somebody else to do it and say, here, I'm avoiding this. You recycle this, I'm not. That's kind of a little combative and somewhat con contains a little anger to it too, because people will actually protest at this stage saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm done denying that this is it. Now I visualize the problem and I'm going to fight to have recycling and just say, let's change the law so that only people that want it do it. So again, to reiterate the strength of, um, you know, emotions and to reflexive thinking is that we tend to be very much social creatures and we are ruled by dominant groups. That means dominant political parties, social groups, religious groups, you name it. It could be any type of group you belong to. And if you say you're an individual, you're not a, that unique an individual that there's not other people like you that you conform to. And there are some principles out there that you follow that probably other people do. And even if you are individualized, you still develop what's called a, a belief perseverance. That means you develop a bias in many things. Now, sometimes this bias is situational. And this is the problem you run into with trying to read a politician or, you know, other people, is that you may have a belief perseverance in one thing, but not for another, depending on the strength or the conditions of that, that thing that you believe in or that need that you're trying to meet. And we also have this factor called confirmation bias, which means that your feelings rarely get confirmed by other people. And we see this sometimes in the media, even though that there is evidence against it, is we tend to look for the things that fit our thinking. And you see this a lot with um, political systems, particularly during elections and, and, and where science, I mean, where where one political party says something, another political party says something contrary, and you go, well, that contrary thing is a lie. It's this and that. It doesn't fit my thinking, and you only pick my thinking. And it's just typical of news stations, too. They tend to take a, a, a belief system and provide con confirmation bias for those people that watch it. You just don't watch the ones that don't you don't agree with, the, the news stories. Probably in a society like ours, a very materialistic things-based society is um, we develop a lot of emotional connections to consumer goods. I mean, and this is particularly true of electronic devices, cell phones, tablets, whatever. And the thing about that is we're also connected to them in wanting bigger and better, this developmental approach, that things got to get better, they got to get faster, they got to do this. We get stuck in that sometimes where we have this built-in obsolescence, a mental obsolescence. I don't have the best car. I don't have a car that looks like this. My car doesn't do this. My car doesn't do that. I was very happy driving the old junkers I had in college that had roll down windows and my old Volkswagen Beetle that was manual and had no electronics whatsoever. You know, nothing to worry about, nothing to break down um, in that car and parts were easy to replace. But 
now I can't buy a car that is simple because we have this consumer driven market that certain things are obsolescent, certain things are old and antiquated and not as good. And you don't see that a lot in developing nations, which is nice because they don't need these upgrades. So this is a big fallacy that we live in, particularly as things get old and they're not as good anymore, including people as a human resource. And that's a problem. So we get into this disposable society. And what's funny, when these things get disposed of, they go to other countries and people are happy with them. And unfortunately, sometimes they have to get recycled to be made into these newer products and better products. So last but not least, think about your motivations. What drives you to the way you meet your needs, the way you use the environment, and the way you perceive how other people are affected by your lifestyle, by your choices, by the way you act, particularly related to the environment? And what are some internal factors in you, attitudes, needs, and desires, how you consider a want from a need? Okay, you know, how do these play? And how do these play in your decision making on not just you as a consumer and where you live, what you're going to do for a job, but how you vote? Because these are all actions and what groups you conform to and how that group impacts other groups and impacts our environmental health. Because think about mostly related to environmental health. And some of you have a motivation where you can accept a lot of harm. Other you, other you want this pure, clean environment that you're willing to spend a lot of money and resources to have it. So just think about it. And guys, and we can come up with motivations that are a global good. And this is what the United Nations is working on with the sustainable, development, the sustainable Development Goals. It's trying to look at us as a world, not as individual nations, not as one type of social economic group or race or type of person in general. We are looking at providing everybody with a common good. And that means others have to give up. But over time, over generations, is that that's not going to be a problem and will become a new norm for how people are motivated to use the earth. But if we don't do it, yes, we're going to go to hell. And I have students that email me regularly about this pessimism that we're never going to change and that's not true. We have seen change. There are people, we've have seen incredible changes that, yes, sometimes got set back, but we always move forward and we are moving forward. And I've seen it in my own lifetime. And I've been part of that change and still continue to be. And hopefully some of you will be part of those positive changes too.